we're t chapter 31 and 32. Okay. Today is February 6th, 2020. And uh, we have the Robert Murphy study guide. Yeah. So I have not read Robert Murphy's um, summary. Uh, I don't know where my copy is. And uh, <laughs> Okay. But I read the book. So I it's think I'm ready for the questions. Better, yeah. Yeah. So what's the first question? Okay. Confiscation and redistribution. Mm. Chapter 32. Mm -hmm. Section 1. The philosophy of confiscation. Why doesn't the alleged dualism of two processes, that of production and that of distribution, exist in a market economy? Because it's all one... Um, process there is no um, consumption or there's no distribution uh, without the production mm -hmm. the purpose of the production is the distribution and consumption it's all one thing so they're, yeah. they're not like separate how does the expropriation affect the accumulation of capital Oh, expropriation affects the accumulation of capital because um, if you are going, it doesn't reduce the amount of capital in the system. It just reduces in whose hands that capital lies. Right. Um, so if, if an entrepreneur creates a million dollars of wealth, and then has half of it taken. That wealth is still there, um, but it's in the hands of someone else. And it discourages the yeah, entrepreneur I'd, I'd from doing it again. <laughs> right, I'd say that, that the act maybe doesn't take any um, wealth out of the system um, at that instant, but I think as soon as that's on the table, it takes future wealth. Away. Well, for sure, because there are entrepreneurs in, even in the existing system um, where if they can't keep a certain portion of the income they've earned, then they choose not to produce at all, mm. uh, which is a nice little um, hat tip to Bastiat of the seen versus the unseen. We, we don't see we do see that the confiscation happens and the capital stays the same but we don't see the capital that's not produced because of the confiscation mm -hmm. okay section two land reform what is it meant by agrarian socialism you want to take a stab at that one um, I, I don't it's uh everyone is equal it's equality of outcome, um, okay. not of opportunity. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure agrarian societies are are ones where no one has any more or less than anyone else. Yeah. Okay. And it's agrarian socialism, I think, would be a, a a societal structure which aims at the equality of all. Yeah. I think uh, Jordan Peterson has the best, um, like, complete breakdown of this idea. Because cause they he talks about like equality. It's like okay, but like under like what dimension do you want equality? Like there's wealth equality. There like should everyone be equal in how smart they are? Should everyone be equal in how blonde their hair is? Mm. And like you can com you can keep dividing like okay equality in what dimension? Right. And when you realize that like. And then the ultimate kind of conclusion after you keep going in all these different dimensions is you're just left with an individual because you keep like dividing all these different dimensions. Mm, but yeah, all that you have left is like what your, your name. Yeah. Um, and perhaps not even that. Right. And There's should that be equal? Yeah. Maybe my name's easier to say than yours. Right. So we can't, or it creates better outcomes. Yeah. Uh, because there are certain segments of the population that have a hard time being hired for jobs because of their names. Mm -hmm. And also, it reminds me, there's a, I think it's called Harrison Bergeron, 
is the name of a short story that was written many years ago about a future society in which everyone wears weights on their bodies to slow them down because it's not fair that some people are more able-bodied mm. than others. And so, like, Olympic athletes have to wear, like, chains and huge, like... Oh, my God. ...weights on their bodies because they can't be allowed to be great. Wow. Yeah. That sounds like a good story to read. It's a good short story, yeah. and it's, uh... Yeah, it's a good one. Um... Uh... What are the unavoidable consequences of government interference with regard to land? So can you repeat that? What are the unavoidable consequences of government interference with regard to land? Uh, well, in the market economy, Mises writes, the soil as a means of produ- is a means of production like any other material factor of production. Plans at aiming at a more or less equal distribution of the soil among the farming population are, under the conditions of the market economy, merely plans for granting privileges to a group of less efficient producers at the expense of the immense majority of consumers. The operation of the market tends to eliminate all those farmers whose cost of production is higher than the marginal costs needed for the production of that amount of farm products the consumers are ready to buy. Mm -hmm. Pretty straightforward. So if the government met what tries to equalize land for people or say you can have this or that, they're just going to Make it worse for the consumers. Yeah. Section three, confisca- confiscatory taxation. Why is discriminatory taxation really just a mode of disguised expropriation of the successful capitalist and entrepreneurs? Uh, um, so... Yeah, I'd, I'd say any special tax at a, a group of people is is basically expropriation, <clears throat> whether they want to call it or not. Like if you're if you're gonna, or let's say the the soda tax on um, in New York, that's just expropriation of you know soda drinkers what was the question exactly again why is discriminatory taxation really just a mode of disguise disguised expropriation of the successful capitalist and entrepreneurs Mm. Mm -hmm. I I mean I would go further than Mises and just say it all is yeah that's that's all of it why is it incompatible with the free market economy? And another question in a second. What are, what are its consequences for the accumulation of capital? I think it's, it's incompatible with the market economy because it um, ignores the reality that all goods are owned at all times. There's no period in which confiscation can happen during a period where it's not owned by somebody that's yeah it's not like oh it's just sitting there and we're going to take half like they're taking it from someone it is confiscatory does confiscatory taxation affect only the rich certainly not yeah uh, most i think affects the poor even though on paper it looks like it affects the rich the most because the poor suffer from a lack of goods that are never produced Mm -hmm. uh, due to that confiscation. Like I would say, if an entrepreneur were able to fully capitalize on their business endeavors without the threat of confiscation, then they could drive down prices and produce more goods 
as much as the consumers are willing to buy. Like um, the guy Rockefeller who drove down mm. the price of oil, like, I don't know, 80 some percent or something. Yeah. Excuse me. What is ironic about the interventionist complaint about the rigid rigidity of big business? I'll read again. What is ironic about the interventionist complaint about the rigidity of big business? Um, rigidity of big business? Yeah. I, I would wager it's just that, you know, business can never be necessarily it could maybe appear rigid but it always is subject to the whims of the market every day it has to change or die yeah and i think the interventionists are always coming in and saying hey we're gonna we're gonna protect the individual from these big corporations and when in reality whenever they interfere they're actually hurting the individual yeah yeah they are well, another is they might think that business is too rigid, like, for example, not switching over to solar power quickly enough. And so they say, we're going to just switch over to solar power. But the business is like, we'll switch over when our thing is not pro um, efficiently producing energy anymore. And our machines have, like, deprecated to the point where we don't want to, we need to buy new machines and we might as well buy the solar power machines instead of the mm. gas powered ones <coughs> but we're not going to switch over sooner because that's going to hurt everybody mm -hmm. does Mises view profits as reward for risk taking this is a trick question um i would say yes that that's what profit is yeah it's what it's too easy there yeah. must be something to that what's um, what's going on here <laughs> Maybe he just got tired of asking <laughs> questions. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So chapter thirty-three, syndal sin. Can you say that word for me? Syndicalism. Syndicalism and corporatism. Corporativism. Yeah. Okay. What are so num number one, the syndicalist idea. What are the two meanings of syndicalism? So I think it's, um, they, people, okay, I'll just read, uh, the term syndicalism is used to signify two entirely different things used by partisans of George Sorel, meaning special revolutionary tactics to be resorted to for the realization of socialism. Um, and the other... I have it right here if you want. Please. A second meaning of syndicalism refers to a method of economic organization. Rather than socialist goal of government ownership over the means of production, syndicalism in the sense aims at giving workers ownership over their, their plants and equipment. It is epitomized in slogans such as the railroads to the railroad men and the miners to the mine. The mines to the miners. That's junk, the, the second meaning, because I think in the end, it's like, no one even ever means that, give the miner, the mines to the miners. It's always just one scam to like, get it to some state power or some, some end power. You might be right. I'm not entirely unsympathetic to this concept. I would like it if more people owned the means of production, if more people could produce for themselves mm -hmm. and owned capital um, that produced for them. I think it's consistent with capitalism. 
it seems paradoxical maybe, but it seems it. I think socialism and capitalism are almost consistent with each other. If a person, if, if people simply seize the means of production for themselves, not seize in terms of taking, but like acquire by uh, through just means, and then operate. If if mines did own the miners, that would be gre- a great thing, mm-hmm. or um, you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, miners own the mines. That 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 could be great. Um, there are some businesses that are run like this, and I think it's moral. It's not immoral otherwise, but it, it seems empowering for people to be so directly connected to the things yeah. that are producing for I them. I mean, the closest kind of business I think of when it comes to that is like a. Um, a pyramid scheme like a you know when people are selling tupperware mm-hmm. which is generally how that that works is the um the individuals at the bottom actually have actually buy the tupperware themselves to like have these you know to go door to door to sell them oh. and they're like in so that they, they own the capital but ah. it's usually set up in the system so that you know, there's someone at the top of the pyramid. So I guess that's why I'm skeptical. Mm. Mm. Also, it seems to me that most people, maybe it's just a a product of today, but they don't have the skills to be entrepreneurs. And so it's best left to entrepreneurs. Like not everyone is a great painter. Mm -hmm. And so the painting is best left to the painters. And there are some people who just shouldn't be entrepreneurs they should be workers in a business, then that that's fine. That's where the everyone's everyone should play to their strengths. Mm-hmm. Two, the fallacies of syndicalism. Why aren't why aren't entrepreneurs and capitalists irresponsible autocrats? Who should the syndicalist syndicalists blame instead? Say that again. I'm <clears throat> sorry. Why aren't entrepreneurs and capitalists irresponsible autocrats? Oh, because they're responsible to the consumers. Who should the syndicalists blame instead? The consumers. <laughs> that's um, yeah. They don't, that's who they're ultimately serving. Mm-hmm. They want to shift um, power from the consumers to the producers. Mm-hmm. Which is wrong. You gotta serve the consumers. Comment. They are like patients who grudge the doctor his success in curing them of a malady. I don't, know, I don't see how that. Applies. <clears throat> yeah. I don't know what a malady is. An ailment. Oh. Okay. Section three. Syndicalists elements in popular policies Uh uh-oh what is the essence of syndicalist policies what is the essence of syndicalist policies Mm -hmm. um i have a the essence of syndicalist policies is to grant privileges to a minority of workers that result in a lower standard of living for the immense majority. Oof. (laughs) So, yeah, I guess. For example, union restrictions may raise wages of a particular group of workers, but they lower wages for excluded workers and lead to higher prices for consumers. Other proposals call for profit sharing or even the outright abolition of unearned income. Quote, unearned income. Right. Um, what are the fallacies of the ability to pay proposals? Ability to pay proposals. I, I don't remember. I don't remember this from the book. Hmm. What was Neither it? Neither do I, but and it's not the, here's a comment too. Okay. If one wants to abolish what is called unearned income, one must adopt socialism. Uh, back to the ability to pay proposal. What I assume is 
that people will do their their best to pay if if you're on an ability to pay system then you're incentivized to not have the ability to pay yeah or or to be dishonest yeah about paying okay I, I remember anytime there's this like a sliding scale of they're like, oh, well, you pay what you can. I'm like, I'll pay nothing. Yeah, there is a, uh, I remember when I was uh, in Durham, there is a grand opening of a, uh, of a like coffee shop. Mm-hmm. And yeah, they, they had that policy for a day and it was. Um, pay On their wh- grand opening. Yeah. Pay whatever you want. And I, like, I was the only one doing it. I was surprised because, like, I was down the road from my house. So I got, they, they closed at, like, uh, four or something. But I remember I got, like, four giant meals, probably, like, $150 in goods. And I, like, paid a dollar each time. Yeah. <laughs> that's the offer. I mean, people respond to incentives, right? So yeah. That's a really bad incentive. It just doesn't, it doesn't add up. It's, it's. It's not going to recoup its costs. It it can't be sustained. Yeah. That was kind of like the um, the first time Dashback was a thing. Oh. Uh, there was, you got like ten dollars every time. And that was clearly unsustainable. That was hilariously unsustainable. Yeah. There's a couple of times me and my friend went to like all the places and spent like a dollar and got sure. a ton of Dash. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> However, it was marketing money well spent because it came from Dash yeah. in order to get people to use Dash and be excited about it, and yeah, it seemed to work. I had one friend that was really all about it. It's like <laughs> he yeah. always wanted to come down to Portsmouth and it get was some fun. Dash. Yeah, it's fun. You could make some money and, and buy things, and yeah, yeah. Well, people respond to incentives. Guild socialism and corporatism. Corporate. There's like a V in there. Yeah, corporativism. That's just the word he uses. I don't know if it's the same as corporatism or maybe it has a slightly different meaning. What is the <clears throat> fundamental idea of corporativism and guild socialism? Did Italy realize the corporatism utopia? Now this section was confusing for me. I had to listen to it twice and still I didn't fully rock it but it seems like guild socialism is when a particular sect of workers from the economy band together Mm -hmm. to form their own little um i don't know like market rates for things and so this is the price of labor for this industry and um these are the demands that we have if we're going to work in this industry, that sort of thing. Yeah. It seems like that's the type of socialism that, um, our economy is most susceptible to because there's There's like electricians unions and yeah, there's all these different like lobbyists for these different industries and yeah, they can, it's, it's easier just to outright ban something in a specific industry for some arbitrary reason. Hmm. So I think if the socialists were smart, they would start with this type of socialism and, and then let it creep in. Yeah. And then go for like the full thing once it like most, because then because when you have all these different, um, like industries locked down, like they're going, they're going to go after healthcare and they're trying to lock it down. Teachers. Yeah. Teachers. So they're locking those down. And so they're going to create these kind of depressed classes, but also everyone else is going to be a little depressed too, because they, they need the healthcare industry. They, they need all these teachers. So then everyone's like, that's how you attack it. Then everyone's weaker. It's kind of like um, uh, divide and conquer hmm. in my eyes. Okay. All right. That makes sense. 
There was a part of the question pertaining to yeah. Germany, um, Italy, and oh, Italy. Did Italy realize the corporatism utopia? I don't know. I, I don't know. Doesn't seem I, I would think fascism would be the corporativist dr- dream, right? It's the total ownership of the means of production by the or it's a public private partnership by the state. I I don't really know. What do you think? Um I don't mean, I don't know specifically about Italy. I can read what they said. Please. The ideas of socialism and corporativism grew out of the desire of the socialists in both Great Britain and Italy to distinguish themselves from the Germans and the Marxists, and Marxists, respectively. They drew on the writings of the eulogists of medieval instu- intuitions, institutions, who praised the guilds as a superior form of organization compared to wage slavery of capitalism. The fundamental idea of both guild socialism and corporativism is that each branch of business forms a monopolistic body that guild or corporazone, I don't know that word, the entire, the entity enjoys full autonomy to determine internal affairs, such as working hours, te- technological conditions, and the quality of its products. The guilds bargain with each other directly, and the state is only involved when such mutual agreements cannot be reached. Oh, interesting. So it sounds like, yes, they, they found a, a new way to organize. Yeah. Um, based on their industry. Mm-hmm. And they traded with each other, not using the state to help them trade. Yeah. Well, that, that seems like at least a, a step in the right direction towards autonomy. Well, yeah, I mean, it depends on which way you're going. It's not individual autonomy. Oh, yeah, I see. There's a vector there. If you're going towards socialism, then yeah. it's kind of not good. Yeah, and I don't, like, you know, the... The state, I mean, it's not the state in this power, but the guild never, never gets smaller. Mm, probably not. Right. Okay. Well, that was good. Yeah. Are there any was, more questions? That was the last question. Hooray. Well, the next section is the economics of war.